All right. I'm here with Dr. Rob Saivez, who just told me not to pronounce his last name, but I think I got it right. And uh, I'm excited to be here. This is going to be a really information-packed episode today. I've spent a lot of time watching and listening to you, Rob, talk about all sorts of things. And I think we're mostly in alignment here. So I really want to bring to light a lot of the things you're doing. One of the things I love about your work is that you are doing this every day. You're in the trenches and you just told me about 60% of your practice has some form of diabetes. And of course, most of the people listening to this either have diabetes or know someone with diabetes or want to prevent diabetes. So I think this message is going to be right on today. And I want to thank you for being here with us. Oh, thank you very much. I'm excited to to talk because as you to become a CDE and then to work in the space that certainly I work in, I think you work in. There's it's almost like you had to have be almost a little bit schizophrenic in terms of what you're taught and how you practice. But that's something we'll explore. So I'm excited to talk to you about this. CDE is a very tough designation to earn. To get there is a starting point, and then to practice and change your mind about stuff is wonderful. So I think there'll be a lot of synergy, but also a lot of things we can explore. Yeah, it's really interesting. I do come from more of a natural health mindset, but worked in a conventional endocrinology office for a year just to see the other side and get some of that core training. And boy, it was really eye-opening. But you're right. I go to scientific sessions and the diabetes educator conventions every year. And it's, I'm literally like a, sa a salmon swimming the opposite way. And I'm sure you feel that way if you end up in those circles as well. But there are more and more, I think, people waking up to this and starting to see things from a little bit of a different perspective, which is really what this is for. That's why we're here together talking about these things. So hopefully we can bring this message to more people and more dietitians and diabetes educators and physicians. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There is no medication that can fix what we do to ourselves. Medications can help, but they don't fix the problem. Yeah, that's so true. And maybe we'll start there a little bit because I think conventionally diabetes is mostly treated as a high blood sugar disease, which of course is a kind of a cardinal sign of diabetes. But Oftentimes, the treatment stops there. It's really give this drug to lower blood sugar. If the blood sugar goes down, problem solved, goal reached, and next patient. And unfortunately, I don't think that does people with diabetes much justice, at least type 2 diabetes, because it's not fixing or addressing or helping the person to address really what's driving the problem to begin with. And I think the high blood sugar is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more there. Do you use medication in your practice? And if you do, how do you fit that in for, let's say, for diabetes specifically or weight loss? And then how do you fit that in with everything else you do? Okay. So absolutely. Medication has a primary role in what we do early on. But the goal of medication, if you think about any form of substance abuse, pretty much every form of substance abuse has a medication that is ancillary or augments or helps a person on their journey to quitting. So if you're quitting smoking, Chantex, Nicorette, even I don't like vaping because it's a surrogate now, has been sold as such. But those are drugs that help you along the journey, especially in the first few months. But the objective is to quit the drug, be free of the disease without any other medications. Whether that's hypertension, the goal is to understand and treat the cause of hypertension and maybe even go up on the medication to control the blood pressure until you've dealt with the cause and then deprescribe. And most doctors are really good at increasing prescriptions because they don't change behavior. They don't address behavior except superficially. But as your behavior changes and as the disease goes into remission, you need to accelerate with medication and then be very comfortable deprescribing. Nobody treats opioids and says Symboxone or Methadone is bad for you. And the same thing in diabetes. There's a host of medications that are accelerants to the treatment of diabetes. And I'm just talking about the two component, the hyperglycemic or the hyperglycemic issue. The type 1s will always be on medication. But even type 1 diabetes, the biggest complication in type 1 diabetes is not type 1. The only difference between a type 1 diabetic and me primarily is the source of our insulin. 
Theirs comes from a needle mine, or a pump. Mine comes from my pancreas. But it's the type 2 component, the resistance to the insulin you're injecting, that causes the complications. In fact, I tell my type 1s they should be, their glycemic indexes or their glycemic numbers should be better than mine because they can control them. I have to do mine vicariously by talking to my pancreas. There's a group called Type 1 Grit, and they had a cohort that was actually researched and published in the journal Pediatrics. And I think their average A1C was in the high fours. It was pretty remarkable. And they, that particular group really strives for optimizing blood sugar and keeping a, a really, if you look at the CGMs, it's just a flat line graph with blood sugars pinned right around 80, 90 or so. And at least it shows that it can be done. And I think you're right. Important point. Just as we go through this, I'll, we'll talk about things that I think need to be highlighted. The average blood sugar, and what you're talking about is the Bernstein method or a modification of Richard Bernstein's method. And it's absolutely way out there in terms of how he manages. We use something similar to that. However, the reason why 5.2 is our threshold to get an A1C of 5.2 or lower is because at that level, at 5.2, your average blood sugar is no longer a significant threat to vascular inflammation. And that's why that 5.2 number is so important. But if you think about most endocrinologists, they diagnose at 6.5, which is a big gap, and then their treatment goal is below 7, which is ludicrous because the damage is being done not because of a threshold number, but somewhere in that continuum. And the damage is being done intravascularly as well as in the interstitial space, which is where your nerves and your ligaments and your tendons live. That's the rule, game plan for that. And the, a normal blood sugar around that number is between 80 and 85, with 83 being the ideal optimal one. So that's an important understanding. However, the other cool thing about CGMs, and you brought that up, and this is just, let's talk about normal for a second. If I look at someone like myself, I'm in deep ketosis, I'm on a carnivore diet, I, my insulin numbers are very low, my glucon's high, so I'll just use an N of 1. When you wear a CGM, blood sugar, and this is a misnomer in our space, blood sugar is not a flat line, and it shouldn't be. Blood sugar, blood glucose, is a responsive element, but the primary driver behind blood sugar should be glucagon, not insulin. And in, in the modern era, insulin has become the dominant hormone. Remember, insulin was discovered in, in, in was it 1909, 1910 by Banting and Best, whereas glucagon was only discovered around 1963, 64. So there's been a long time where we focused on insulin for type 1s, and we didn't even know about glucagon. When the Randall cycle was being done in 1963, they didn't even know about glucagon. So it's a, and GLP-1 is only a hormone that we've known about for a very short period of time, which controls insulin and glucagon. We can talk more about that. However, if you look at normal, let's take someone who's not eating. The way that the body works is it uses glucagon primarily and then insulin just a little bit to create what's called an insulin clamp or a glucagon clamp, which is an upper limit and a lower limit, and you fluctuate between those. So if I watch, if I'm just doing my thing through the day, my blood sugar will drift down. And I've seen my blood sugar normally go down into the high 40s. But just last week, I was at 43, 47, high 50s. Asymptomatic because I've got ketones, fat as a backup fuel source for my brain, which really governs those symptoms that you feel when you're low. So it's not a low, it's normal. But there's a threshold low where glucagon kicks in and glucagon goes up and releases sugar from the liver and turns protein and glycerol from fat into sugar and your blood sugar starts to rise. And then it reaches an upper threshold where insulin, a small amount of insulin gets secreted to bring that down. So I'll see myself grow from the 50s up into the high 80s, low 90s, and then come down. And you're fluctuating within that. Now you go for a run, you may see it go up to 140, 150, but then very quickly come down. So we shouldn't buy into the fact that glucose, that blood sugar should be a flat line. We've got to understand what we're doing. And the beauty about a CGM is it gives you those readings every five minutes. And you don't want to panic. So if you're testing a finger stick and you're at 95, oh my God, I'm high. Or if you're at 53, oh my God, I'm low. I've got to go eat some glucose tabs. Not necessarily. And I find it very difficult in the modern era to justify managing diabetes without a CGM. 
Yeah, that's such a great point about glucagon because I don't think it's talked about that much. And so glucagon is like the the sister hormone to insulin, also released by the pancreas, by the alpha cells. And the pancreas is really like a sensor that measures our blood sugar, dipping that meter in the pool to check chlorine. It's always checking our blood sugar. And if it's too low, the cells that make insulin kick in a little bit, or excuse me, glucagon kick in a little bit. And if it's too high, the cells that make insulin will kick in a little bit and release those hormones. And I think to go back to the medication discussion, I think this is one of the important things that medication can do is lower blood sugar enough for a while to allow the pancreas to start to heal. Because oftentimes people come into your office or another physician's office and they've had high blood sugar for a while, maybe didn't even know about it, and their pancreas has just been desensitized and beat up. And so sometimes they need a period of time to have lower blood sugar for that to actually start to function normally again. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in large part, I mentioned the normal natural fasting fluctuation in blood sugar, but that is a very fine interplay between glucagon and, and insulin, where they're really, it's like a vibration. They're vibrating off each other to keep that, that, those numbers normal. Now, ancillary to that, You've got your steroid hormones, you've got your adrenocortical hormones, the fright and flight hormones, you've got human growth hormone, you've got T3, you've got testosterone in males and females. All of those hormones affect that insulin clamp. But ultimately, there's this tremendous interplay, and the ideal hormonal setting is where those are almost vibrational. Now, when you disrupt that, as you've said, by chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption or by excessive protein consumption on a regular basis, you create a disconnect in that fine balanced control system. And what happens is glucagon should be the dominant hormone, which is your catabolic hormone or your utilization hormone. We're under the influence of glucagon for most of the day, we should be using our stores. But if you're snacking, if you're eating way more food than you need, the body prioritizes the storage of those and the protection of the body from that excess, whether it's excess protein or excess sugar. It's very difficult to eat excess fat, although it is possible. So when the body has to be in storage mode for a prolonged period of time, instead of glucagon being your dominant hormone, insulin is your dominant hormone, and it overrides into the time period where you're not eating because your body is now taking a longer and longer time to deal with what should have been a small meal. It's now overriding into that period of time when you're not eating and you become insulin dominant. Any space in the human body where you've got an excess of sugar, that excess of sugar is going to cause injury and the body has a primary obligation to protect you against that. So you can get inflammation in the gut. We see a lot of GI pathology, autoimmune pathology, but GI pathology related to excess carbohydrates in the gut, primarily from the sugar, but also from the proteins that come along with that, celiac disease, that kind of thing. We'll talk about that on another day. Then the blood sugar gets taken up by the liver, and the liver has an extraordinary capacity to store that sugar and convert that sugar to fat, but that's what we call a fatty liver. So a fatty liver is absolutely 100% not related to the consumption of fat. Fat doesn't even go to the liver, at least the long chain fats. They go straight to the fat cells via the lymphatics. So that argument that most people use for fatty liver is false. Fatty liver is the liver desperately trying to protect you from excess sugar or excess protein by converting it to fat. And that's where your triglycerides come along. And that's why high triglycerides are a marker of cardiovascular injury, far more important than LDL is when you come to cardiovascular, but all the doctors do is they focus on LDL. They don't really understand nor look at the triglycerides. Be that as it may, then some of that sugar spills over into the bloodstream. And now we see a rise in blood sugar. And here's the interesting thing, Brian, is there's two populations that we've identified genetically in our practice. So what happens is when your blood sugar goes up, that starts to cause inflammation of the blood vessel. And so therefore the insulin system kicks in and it's designed to clear the sugar. But when the sugar is cleared, it typically goes into the cells. We'll talk about the interstitial space in a little bit. But when it gets into those cells, it damages the cells. It causes inflammation and damages the cells. So the cells protect themselves from this tsunami of sugar by phosphorylating or blocking the receptor to insulin. And that's called insulin resistance. 
Now you've got two populations. One population can produce a massive amount of insulin, and we can measure that every day I measure insulin. Very few endocrinologists ever measure insulin. But if you know what your insulin level is, you can understand whether you're obesogenic or diabesogenic. So the insulin at high levels shoves the sugar into the fat, especially the liver and the fat cells. Those people become enormous, but they have relatively normal blood sugars, and they're insulin resistant, but they'll never be diabetic or very late be diabetic because they genetically can produce a lot of insulin. Then there's another group that cannot produce that much insulin, that their insulin response, ah, they can't get the sugar into the cells. And those people, the sugar builds up in the bloodstream and the interstitial space, and we call that disease at a certain damage threshold to red blood cells, we call that diabetes or prediabetes. So there are two separate populations. And as you become more diabetic, you become less able to become fat. You may be overweight, but you're not going to be enormous. So that's an important metric. So we've got these two populations based on genetics. One primarily suffers the diseases of hyperinsulinemia. The other population suffers the diseases of hyperglycemia. And they're a separate population. And the interesting thing is with our type 1 diabetics who are injecting insulin, they may have actually both diseases. They have the hyperglycemia as well as the hyperinsulinemia if they're using huge doses of insulin to keep their blood sugars down. And that is problematic because the diseases associated with hyperinsulinemia, obesity, dementia, cancer, autoimmune disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, the diseases associated with diabetes, heart attack, strokes, vasculopathy, nerve damage, neuropathy, and ligament and tendon injury. So the injury of diabetes occurs in the blood vascular space as well as in the interstitial space as the sugar leaks into that space between the blood vessels and the cells, and that's diabetes. So I know that was a little bit of a monologue there, but it's so important. Most endocrinologists cannot articulate that. And if you can't understand that process, you can't treat it. Yeah, that's so good. And so let's unpack that just a little bit more. And I want to talk about some of the different theories that I've heard put forward around insulin resistance. So you described it as these two different pathways where essentially insulin resistance is an adaptive mechanism there to stop the excess glucose from getting into the cell because it can be toxic at high levels and lead to that glycation and oxidative stress. There are, of course, other theories about insulin resistance. We've heard that high levels of insulin chronically can cause insulin resistance. We've heard from Schulman and others that it's the intracellular lipid that can lead to insulin resistance. And where that fat comes from, of course, is also up for debate. But at some point, it gets into those cells. There's the inflammation argument that these inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-6, IL-1-beta and so forth can block insulin signaling in the cell. Some people talk about certain toxins like BPA, for example, that can interfere with insulin signaling. So how do you unpack all that? And what do you think is really the primary driver for most people of insulin resistance? This is a problem, Brian, with healthcare in general is that we have become more epidemiologic in our evaluation of disease, and we make more observations of existing criteria in someone with disease. So all of those things you've just mentioned are present to some extent or another in people who are obese or diabetic, and they're not present in people that are otherwise healthy, that are not diabetic, not obese, and otherwise are healthy. So, for example, the common sentiment, even by very learned people, is that obesity causes a variety of diseases. And all these things are just intricacies of obesity, but obesity doesn't cause disease. Obesity is a consequence of a disease. In other words, obesity is the result of a problem, and obesity primarily hurts your back, your hips, your knees, your ankles. It is obesity, the ability to make fat, is a protective device. And whether that fat is deposited in the muscles where it's around the organs, that depends on what the hormonal state is about where you deposit it. So if you're high progesterone, you're going to have lipedema. Not lymphedema, but lipedema. If you have high testosterone, you're going to have central visceral fat. If you are insulin resistant with high testosterone, that's going to be infiltrated in your pancreas and other organs. The muscles, if you're not using the muscles, if you and you can take a cow and grain feed a cow and you can see marbled the Wagyu type meat, you can take a free range cow 
and you can see pure muscle with all the fat on the outside. So it, those are observations, but they don't describe physiology. And the problem with epidemiolo the epidemiologic shift that happened in medicine around 1990 is that we use observations and we assign causality to something that at best is an association. And that is the biggest mistake we've made in assumptions about healthcare. If you look at the pathophysiology, where you do something and you measure that effect over time, that is understanding the pathway of disease. Physiology is the pathway of disease. So you have to create those events from normal in order to understand what causes it. So, for example, you can feed somebody seed oils all day long and nothing happens. But as soon as you add carbohydrates to that mix, that's where the problem starts coming in. In my PhD, we infused huge amounts of fat into livers. And the livers were perfect, no inflammation of the blood vessels. I mean, you could look at that bloodstream and it was white with lipids. As soon as you added the carbohydrates, that's where the injury came in. So you've got to prove this from normal. You can't prove this from, from observations of existing disease. Does that make sense? And those are very difficult studies to make. So, yes, there's a ton of theories, but most of those theories are based on association of an already damaged sp space rather than a corrective space. And that's the challenge. What is it about the fat and the carbohydrates together that creates the problem? And then what problem does it actually create? So I'm going to tell you that carbohydrates by themselves, and all you have to do is wear a CGM. You can eat an apple or a donut, and the donut has a mixture of fat and fructose, glucose, and fats, especially polyunsaturated fats, whereas the apple is primarily fructose and glucose, with the apple having higher amounts of fructose and glucose than the donut. And if you're wearing a CGM, the apple will get your blood sugar to go higher and stay up longer, and every diabetic knows that, than the donut. But nobody is fat because they ate a donut, or nobody's, di sorry, nobody's diabetic or fat because they ate the apple. There, it's because of the association of the fat, the seed oils, and the fat that is the most powerful endorphin activator in your brain. So there's the, it's the desirability factor. It's the drug factor. Heroin fentanyl is what everybody's using, and they're dying from it, but it gives them this incredible powerful high. You can chew a cocoa leaf all day long and not be addicted to that. So a part of it is the way that these things are manufactured and packaged. And remember... Apart from avocados, we just don't see carbohydrates with fat by themselves without protein and carbohydrates and fat and protein exist together in nature. But it's very rare that we see fat and protein, sorry, fat and carbohydrates as a mixture. But fat, salt and carbohydrates are manufactured and are extremely endorphin activating. And it's our desire for that because remember, carbohydrates don't cause diabetes. Carbohydrates do not cause diabetes. It is our relationship with them, chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, that has that problem. So once you are diabetic, the apple is going to make it worse. But the apple didn't cause the problem in the first place. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. A glass of red wine doesn't make you an alcoholic. Your relationship with the glass of red wine does. And we've got to look at this from a substance abuse perspective from a, as a causal problem not from a calories in, calories out, or carbohydrates in, or carbohydrate ratio. We've got to take the science out of it and bring the psychology into it when it comes to type 2 diabetes. So is that a lot of what you do with your clients and patients, is work on that part of it, their relationship to food, and try to help them prove that? There's a duality. You've got to understand the damage that the carbohydrates are doing and return back to a more nutritional, a human nutrition form of eating. But you've also got to understand that this is a substance abuse problem at its core. And it's because of the substance that we abuse and your genetic biology that resulted in diabetes or resulted in obesity. If you just treat the obesity, you're going to lose the weight, but you're not going to keep it off because you haven't changed the behavior. So it really is a change. You've got to understand what you're eating and modify that. That's easy. What's more difficult is to change why you need to eat that way. And it's the pattern as well as, the, as, well as the, the drug that's important. The majority of the world, Brian, still exists on dominant carbohydrate consumption because they're still living in a world where food scarcity is a problem. And they're not diabetic. They're not fat. 
So it's not the carbohydrates in their diet, but they are living on the borderline of not having enough. For the first time in centuries, we are dealing with massive abundance of manufactured foods. And therein lies the problem. That it's the chronic excessive consumption and the shift away from eating for nutritional survival toward eating for emotional management that is the problem. And then the biology dictates itself. So in terms of medication, I know you want you started there and we've got to circle back to that. We have to define what medications help people to change, help the blood sugar, help the weight loss. And really it's that insulin resistance that we need to deal with. Because the other thing that we've Myself and a guy like Ben Bickman, he's done it with cells in his lab. We've done it clinically. And here's an interesting thing. We talked about glucagon and insulin having this synergistic relationship, not synergistic, but this vibrational relationship when you're fasting. But what is, so if I look at insulin in the body, it looks like a penny farthing, the old penny farthing bicycles with a little back wheel and the big front wheel. So... When you're fasting, your insulin release, a tiny fraction of insulin release, is mediated by slight increases in blood sugar and increases in the beta cell sugar entry, okay? However, when you have a big sugar bolus, that mechanism doesn't work. So if I put a, an IV into you and I inject sugar, like we do at every hospital, they put you on dextrose, <clears throat> Those patients' blood sugars go through the roof because they do not have an insulin response, <clears throat> even though their blood sugar is up. Or if you eat a big fillet steak, you eat meat, but you're not getting fat to protect that meat, or your body is turning that excess protein into sugar, and that blood sugar rises three or four hours after you've eaten, that sugar doesn't come down. Why not? Do you know what the, and this is something we've discovered, Ben did it in his cells, we've discovered this in our humans. In our carnivore patients, they do great and then their blood sugars start rising. And the reason for that is because blood sugar does not trigger insulin. Blood sugar does not trigger insulin, at least not to the point that it clears excess sugar. The thing that, and it's pretty obvious if you think about it biologically and evolutionarily, the thing that triggers, and this is an important thing when we talk about drugs, the thing that triggers the big front wheel of insulin release is GLP-1. And carbohydrates trigger GLP-1, and GLP-1 triggers insulin release, and also simultaneously blocks glucagon. And then, and then finally has an appetite sufficient thing. So GLP-1 triggering is required to have your big insulin release at the time of meals. Whereas minor fluctuations in blood sugar will trigger a little bit of insulin release, that back wheel, the front wheel, requires GLP-1. So in our carnivores who are eating lean protein, their blood sugar will go up after GLP, long after GLP-1 is gone, and they can't reduce that blood sugar. So their A1Cs start to rise, their blood sugars go up, their triglycerides go up. If you add fat to the mix, the fat suppresses the amount of protein they eat, and the fat pr protects the protein because they're now in deep ketosis. But then in those patients, paradoxically, we have to add a little bit of carbohydrate to trigger GLP-1, not to add to sugar to the bloodstream, but to trigger GLP-1 at a meal to trigger that insulin. That's how complex this management is becoming. And that is why I love the GLP-1 agonists, the Ozempics, the Trulicides, the Manjaros, the Wegovies. I love those drugs as a very effective, healthy way to treat insulin resistance. But if you're just anywhere from the Kim Kardashians to my garbage man and everybody in between that's, on, uh, that's using Ozempic as a monotherapy, that's where you're seeing the problems. And my friend Ken Berry just did a, a railing against the Ozempics when it's used as a single drug to treat weight loss because you're not modifying your behavior. You're not making any behavioral change. And then you see all the side effects without significant sustainable benefits. So that's a drug that is horribly misused, but it's a beautiful, wonderful drug that I absolutely love as a part of a multimodal therapeutic approach to, di to type 2 diabetes. Yeah, it does. It makes sense from a 
mechanistic perspective, physiologic perspective, some of these drugs don't make a lot of sense. That one does. And it is quite effective, certainly for weight loss and does seem to lower blood sugar. And like you said, it does it in a way that makes a lot of sense. I think the challenge with using it as a weight loss drug and just to reinforce what you're saying here, is that unless you're planning on being on that drug forever, you've got to at some point change behavior. And now we're starting to hear from the endocrinology community and weight loss medicine community, which I know you're part of, but we're starting to hear that this was never meant to be a short-term treatment, that it was always meant to be a lifestyle drug that you're going to be on forever. And that, of course, the clinical trials weren't done on patients for 20 years, so we don't really know what that's going to do. Every one of those concepts is false. The first thing is that the medication, even if you used it forever, it stops working after a period of time because you get a normal response to it and the response fails. So if it's used for longer than about six to eight months, the effect levels off when it's used for weight loss or insulin resistance if you don't change the behavior. But the ideal way to use those drugs is, at least in my type 2 and my obese patients, is we would use Chantix on somebody trying to quit smoking, is to manage the gradient of blood sugar to intracellular sugar and bring that down to manage diet. And as a, an in, initiating factor, I use it typically for 12 to 24 weeks, but not longer than that. And in fact, we know this because the Ozempic step trials, they did four trials, step one through four, they all showed recidivism when people came off, even after two years, when it was used as a monotherapy. So that's crazy because it's just misused. It's misused. And in fact, if you look at Weight Watchers, they just bought for $1.3 billion a company of doctors that are doc in the box that you call them up and you say, oh, my BMI is over 27. Okay, here's your script. And they write the scripts for GLP-1s. And yes, you lose weight. So kumbaya, but where are you five years later? And you've done yourself a huge disservice and possibly some musculoskeletal injury. The other interesting thing, Brian, we've just completed a trial still following them, but we've completed the one-year trial of type 1 diabetics. And in type 1, GLP-1s are contraindicated because they don't make insulin. We use GLP-1s to suppress appetite and also to block gluconeogenesis. Because the problem in a type 1, or even on a carnivore diet, is their liver is releasing a ton of sugar to the bloodstream. And we have been able, on average, to reduce insulin requirement by one-third just by using a GLP-1 in our type 1s. So it's an incredibly useful drug in type 1s who are struggling to maintain, to manage their amplitude adequately. And there's the Ozempics of the GLP-1s prevent you from going too low where, and it reduces your overdosing. So the long-acting insulins, if you use them, work better in the type 1s. So we've seen that beneficial effect in the ones in whom it is currently contraindicated. And that's the glucagon suppressing effect. That's the glucagon and the appetite suppressing effect, the combination. So it, that for me is a forerunner drug. But in the management of type 2, and this is where I disagree with Jason Fung, who had a brilliant idea, but, he, but it was too aggressive, which is the full suitcase. Now, Jason's a friend of mine. Jason revolutionized the world in a very good way by introducing the concept of intermittent fasting. And I know the backstory to that. But the suitcase is not too full. And how do I know that absolutely? Because if you look at insulin production in a, di in a diabetic, it is far lower at its peak than it is in my obese patients who have normal blood sugar. So in a diabetic, their insulin might be, you measure their insulin levels with insulin resistance, a type 2, that might be in the 12, 13, 14 range. Their C-peptide might be 2, 2.2, 2.4, and their blood sugars are in the 200s. So we know that 14, 12, 14 units of insulin is inadequate to manage that blood sugar because they're insulin resistant. Producing a lot of insulin, but it's ineffective, it's not working. But you take my obese patients, their insulin might be 30, 40. I've, the highest insulin I've seen is 117, fasting insulin. Okay, So he's sitting there, 117 insulin is 500 and something pounds, and his blood sugar is 79. You inject me with 100 units of insulin, I'm dead in five minutes. So A1C at 5.6. So he's so the point that I learned from those obesogenic people is don't be afraid in your type 2s to go up on the insulin dosing 
to bring the gradient down. The first most important thing about managing a type 2 from a dietary perspective and a medication perspective is to flatten the gradient between blood sugar and intracellular sugar. Intracellular sugar runs around 50 to 80. Blood sugar around 80 to 100 or in the 80s to 90s is the ideal. But you want to flatten that gradient. And as you flatten that gradient or even drop it a little low, the cells now are going to demand sugar rather than protect themselves from sugar. And over the course of a few months, they'll recruit and dephosphorylate insulin receptors. So your insulin receptor population in those membranes increases and you need less insulin to get the sugar into the bloodstream. So you have to, it's a little bit like NASCAR. You've got to turn left to go right. You've got to go up to come down. And that is something that our community, the ketogenic community, oh, we've got to deprescribe. Within a week, you can come off your insulin. To my mind, that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Because my target is not 6.5 and lower. My target is 5.2. And I want that gradient to be flat in order to achieve that. So I go up to come down. Once you're there, you can slowly deprescribe. And even once you're there, you still want to continue to either check your self-monitored blood glucose. And if your blood glucose on any given day is a little high, the one drug that I will keep available to my type 2s and allow them to use it as they need it is metformin. Metformin, berberine, or inositol are good medications just to damp down that little bit of an elevated blood sugar. And sometimes our long-standing type 2s still have a bit of dysregulation between glucagon and insulin. Okay, that's great. Really good practical information. You mentioned insulin testing. We, you talked about the fasting insulin in someone with diabetes, someone who is obese and has a lot of excess fat. And I think you made a really good point of the value of checking insulin. I think it's important to know where someone is there. What are some of the other tests that you do that maybe aren't considered conventional? For example, have, do you ever test glucagon? Is there value to that? Do you test, inflammation markers, other hormones? What do you think is important to look at? I think the important thing, and again, when I talked about epidemiology versus physiology, is in the modern era, we practice algorithm medicine. So we look at a number and we throw a medication at the number. So we'll test a TSH. Oh, your TSH is high. Here's your thyroid hormone. But we don't know what the interplay is. And certainly in the metabolic space, everything's an interplay. So I look at blood work to tell a story. I want to know what your story is. Are you type 1 IR, type 2 IR? Are you diabetic? Are you insulin sensitive? And that story requires a number of interacting elements. So I will look at routinely, if you come into my office, you're going to get a blood glucose, a fasting blood glucose, and typically an 8 to 12 hour. I don't want to see a 24 hour fasting blood glucose. I don't want to see that along because that's a different dynamic. I want to see what it is over about 8 to 12 hours. But I'll do an insulin, a C-peptide, a glucagon on everybody. I do a testosterone level, male and female, on everybody. I do a DHEA sulfate on everybody because all of those speak to insulin resistance. I do a lipid panel and I'd like to see VLDL together with that. I need LDL, VLDL, HDL, triglycerides, and cholesterol with cholesterol being the least important, but that's my that's the dynamic there. I also want to see a vitamin D level because vitamin D is actually a steroid hormone it, which is influenced by insulin. So all of those metrics are important for me. And I've got to, there are other micronutrient numbers that don't necessarily play into insulin resistance, but it's the interplay of all of those numbers that are important to me. So I look at calcium. If your calcium's low, you may be underdosed on vitamin D or you may be insulin resistant. And if you're hyperinsulinemic, your calcium may be low because your vitamin D is low and your testosterone, if your male is going to be low and your testosterone is going to be high in a female, and you're going to have PCOS versus gestational diabetes. Those two are polar opposite effects based on insulin production. So all of those numbers absolutely matter. My inflammatory markers, white cell count, eosinophil count, I look at ferritin, I sometimes will do a CRP, but not very often because it's so up and down. I never do cortisol levels because they're fickle. They're useless to me. And so it, the markers of inflammation are also going to tell the story. But if it's intravascular, intracellular inflammation, where is that happening? And I want to be able to tell the story from a therapeutic perspective. So there are people that do deep dives into the blood work, but that's nice to know. But how are you really going to manage that? That set of numbers allows me to understand where that patient is, what expectations we have. 
of them. Are they going to be vascular injury patients? Are they going to be dementia or cancer risk patients? What is that risk? And then how do we manage that from a dietary perspective, from a behavioral perspective, and from a medication perspective? Yeah, that's interesting. I love the idea of the blood work telling you a story, and that is really the reason to do it. You want to understand more about what's going on with that person in front of you. One of the things we've been doing for the past year or so is adiponectin and leptin testing and free fatty acid testing to try to get a sense of what's going on with the fat cell and how healthy the fat cells are. And we can talk a little bit about that if you want, but I'm curious about glucagon because that's one that I've thought about doing. I I saw a talk between Dave Feldman and Ben Bickman, and they were talking about glucagon testing. And even though Ben liked it, liked the idea of it, it didn't seem like there was a lot of value in the glucagon because it didn't seem to vary that much from one person to the next. So if you've been doing it, what do you see and why do you feel like it's important to look at? Yeah, I, glucagon is a very important number for me. And I, Ben is a colleague and just a wonderful mind. And what I love about Ben is Ben Ben's primary focus is the cellular environment where you can learn so much. My Petri dish is within a, the human skin. So it's a much more difficult model to work with because we're not rats in cages. We're not cells in Petri dishes. But glucagon absolutely varies based upon what your insulin dynamics are. It is a great marker and a surrogate for having to do craft tests, which are really, I use them from time to time, the glucose tolerance test, but they are very cumbersome to do. And in order to do a good craft test, you need at least a four hour test, maybe even five hours, because some people will crash at the four hour mark. I've got some people that will see a 30 at four hours, but if you do it too, so the craft test is a cumbersome, difficult test. Most labs won't do it. Glucagon gives me, glucagon together with insulin, C-peptide and blood sugars and A1Cs, Give me a more holistic picture. And glucagon represents how hard or how much of your blood sugar is coming from production versus consumption. Remember, this job is to release sugar from the liver stored as glycogen and also for gluconeogenic purposes. And glucagon's primary responsibility, and I don't know exactly what the signaling is, but glucagon responds to intracellular sugar. It does not necessarily respond to blood sugar. A little bit at the lower side, but I think that the driver there is not blood glucose. The driver is intracellular glucose. And it may be intracellular glucose in the alpha cell. I don't know at exactly which point the mess. There's so many messengers that we still don't know about. We're just starting to discover. Leptin is an interesting molecule because leptin had a lot of promise 20 years ago. But we found that leptin is a useless molecule therapeutically. And also when leptin is broken, the leptin hormonal control system is broken in someone who's obese. So it doesn't, ha- it, it only really has value when someone's healthy and thin. And the, just to talk about leptin, because it's such an important hormone, it's one of the five hormones, there's probably more, but one of the five hormones that are the satiety, me- the hormonal satiety mechanism, which most human beings have been indoctrinated to override. So there are two satiety hormones, there's the, or two satiety pathways. The first one are stretch receptors in the stomach. So when I, as a surgeon, put a balloon into someone's stomach, their stomach stretches, there are receptors in the stomach lining called EGLE, E-G-L-E-S receptors, that get triggered by the vagal nervous, the nervous pathway, go back to the brain and say, hey, you've had enough to eat. And I can induce that by blowing a balloon up in your stomach. And that's the principle of bariatric surgery, in part, is to reduce the size of the stomach so a smaller amount of food gives you that bigger nerve pop. Then there's the hormonal system. And the hormones are GLP-1, the somatostatins, the somatomedins, peptide YY, DPP-4, and then leptin. And those are the the hormones that give us feedback. There are a few more. Oh, I'm terrible at the names of these. But there are about three or four more hormones that are all in that somatomedin category that are promising from a pharmaceutical perspective because we can manipulate them and there are drugs that can manipulate them. Leptin is a feedback, a satiety hormone that comes from fat cells. So leptin is very late in the pathway. The early pathways are going to be your somatostatin, your lept, your GLP-1s, DPP-4, and then the final one is the peptide YY. And GLP-1 actually has two sites of action, upper gut and lower gut, and it has different functions of satiety. 
But it takes time for those hormones to go back to your brain and say you're full. And what we've learned to do, how do you decide, Brian, how much you're going to eat at a meal? Some of it is based on behavior, putting together what I normally eat. And then at some point, I'm no longer hungry and I stop eating. I'm going to, to that may be true for you, but for the majority of my population, and I believe for you too, but you can ask yourself this question. Most of us, if we haven't eaten for a while, have a predetermined idea. Our brains have a predetermined idea of how much we think we need. And it's based on the conventional portion sizes in our environment and this ridiculous concept that dietitians tell us we need to eat, how much we need to eat. And I'll come back to that in a second. So we prepare that amount of food and we put it in front of us. And we've been indoctrinated to eat so quickly and to eat to the point of discomfort. You know what cutting is where people intentionally cut themselves, they create that pain for that pleasure. We tend to overeat very quickly. Oh my God, I'm stuffed. We're hurting ourselves for that bizarre sense of pleasure on the back end. So we completely override any satiety signals. So even if you look at the leptins and the peptide YYs and the DPP4s, and this is why the GLP-1 agonists fail over time, is because we override them. And GLP-1s make you feel like crap when you overeat or you eat carbohydrates, but that's like ant abuse with an alcoholic. They know they're going to feel like crap if they drink, but they still do it. And every heroin addict makes the decision to shoot up, even though they know they're going to turn blue and die. So we overeat and we override, and that's why the GLP-1s cannot be forever, because they're not going to work, and you stop using them. Fentamine, similar effect. So the point is that we as a society have learned to overeat to the point of excess, and we override any hormonal satiety. And when that system then gets broken, it doesn't work, and we gain that weight, or we become insulin resistant. I'll give you a simple little thing. thing. I've got a two-and-a-half-year-old son. And he's 95% carnivore. We've raised him that way. He's never eaten a carbohydrate in his life before as a carbohydrate. Now, some milk and that kind of thing, but never eaten a carbohydrate. And we will put food in front of him. He's very rarely hangry. He doesn't get hungry. But, and he's a big boy. But he will sit down with a plate of food. And there are times when he'll eat two bites. And he'll just push it away and say no. And he will nothing can get him to eat more. And then there are times when we'll eat the food in front of him and look at mine and grab my food. And he's never eaten baby food. He's only eaten our food. He's two and a half years old. He'll grab my food and eat that as well. And he'll eat this pile of food at some times. And sometimes it's two or three bites. Because his decision to eat is dictated by his belly telling his brain when he's had enough, rather than his brain telling his belly how much he's going to get. And that override plays into diabetes tremendously as well as obesity. Okay, we're getting on the back end of our podcast here. So let's look at solutions. We've talked a lot about what diabetes is. I think we've talked a lot around how it happens. How do we fix it? How do you put it into remission? How do you help somebody gain control of their blood sugar and then make long-term impacts so that they can get healthier over time? So the first thing is how not to do this. And the two absolute fails are to try to argue with anybody that has an opposite expectation of us. The lipid heart people, forget about it. There is a economic political advantage to doing this. And if anybody wants to tell me, oh, we shouldn't stop trying, I'll give you a simple statement. We still sell cigarettes. There is zero reason, zero reason other than economics and politics to still sell cigarettes and vaping. And yet we do. There's this enormous mountain of evidence that it's a really bad idea. So in our lifetime, we'll never fix the socioeconomic political side of eating and drinking. And it's manufactured food. It's basically a drug industry. Starbucks is one of the biggest crack houses in the country. So we're never going to fight that battle. So we have to, number one, do it at an individual basis. And we have to educate interested individuals that, yes, there's huge benefit to eating carbohydrates psychologically, but the liability is on the back end where you pay the price of, over time, metabolic dysfunction whether that's obesity, diabetes, or any of the other diseases, and you are far more likely of all the diseases you're going to die from to die from the disease of carbohydrate excess. Whether it's cancer, whether it's diabetes, whether it's cardiovascular disease, whether it's dementia, 
Almost all of those are directly and definitely indirectly impacted by chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. So when an individual chooses to seek me out, I share that information with them. And ultimately, Brian, what's going to happen to you and me? The one thing I can guarantee you, we're going to die. How we get there is our choice. So I put the information in front of my patients and I say, okay, you choose, but you can't be in the middle. You either do this or you do this, but being in the middle is crazy. So we have to represent an opposite or a more cognitively functional pathway for our growing group of patients to follow. But it's a field of dream things. They will come. You can't fight, at least it's really difficult to fight people. Let our patients become advocates on our behalf rather than we fight the endocrinologists or fight the lipid heart people. It's just not going to happen. It's interesting that the cardi cardiologists are starting to use a word called euglycemia. But as soon as you put them on a ketogenic diet, which is the best form of euglycemia, and the LDL goes up, no, you mustn't do that. So what do they do? They use SGLT2 inhibitors, Jardians. Oh, this Kumbaya drug, because it lowers your blood sugar without really making the, LDH go, the LDL go up significantly. But now the SGLT2s are probably the worst class of drugs that we can use mm. in our space. They're terrible diabetic drugs and dangerous diabetic drugs. So... The messaging is toward those that want to know, not trying to convince those that don't want to know. And that, for me, is the growing body. Because if we were wrong, we, this would have died before Atkins. And we're not wrong. We're not wrong. And unfortunately, like so many things, like the tobacco industry, like prohibition before that, a huge number of humans have to get sick and die before society transforms. We can try to accelerate that, but ultimately it's one person at a time. I love where you went with that because you took it to a really high level of like, how can we shift the diabetes epidemic? How can we stop the epidemic? And it's really one person at a time on a grassroots level, the people who want to change. If you have one of those, which I know you do, you have lots of them in your practice who come in and say, doc, I want to change. I want to get rid of this. I'm willing to take action. I'm willing to do what you want me to do. Just tell me what to do. What's it look like for most people? Is it carnivore diet for most? people? Is it low carb, keto, lifestyle change? What's the typical treatment approach look like? And this is where I have a huge argument within our own space. Brian, what is the only thing? What? Let me ask you this. What should an alcoholic drink? Nobody tells alcoholics what they should drink. It's pretty obvious. Stop drinking alcohol and what you do drink doesn't matter that much. Am I right? Okay. And nobody needs to know how much alcohol to drink. It's binary. Yes, I'm drinking alcohol. No, I'm not. So if you're fat or diabetic, one or two, the answer is exactly the same. Don't eat carbohydrates. Nothing else matters. If you want to be mostly vegetarian, mostly carnivore, I don't care. If you want to be a hybrid, don't eat carbohydrates and don't snack. A snack is always an emotional event, always. Whether it's pepperoni and cheese or ice cream and chocolates, a snack is always an emotional event. And if you do those two things, you can't be carbohydrate sick. Then there are nuances we can tweak but those are the, I'll hate to use this analogy, but those are the pimple on the elephant's butt. They aren't the elephant. Carbohydrates, not even fat or seed oils, because, oh, seed oils, seed oils. Where in a non-carbohydrate diet do you really eat a lot of seed oil? You don't. So if I'm not eating carbohydrates, if I'm not eating processed foods, if I'm eating vegetables and meat, there's not a lot of seed oils. So you, to say, seed, yeah, seed oils are a problem, but I don't have to focus on them because if you focus on the carbohydrates, it doesn't matter. If you've got celiac disease, don't eat carbohydrates. You never have to worry about celiac disease. That's, there's no celiac disease in leafy vegetables or in meat. There's no gluten. So those are the things. It just If you simplify this and make it obvious where you're changing principles, you're changing behavior principles, it's very easy. The three principles we use is don't eat carbohydrates, eat fat and protein. And by the way, don't talk to me about protein. Zoe Harkham, who's a beautiful dietitian, beautiful in that regard, but just has done such elegant work in terms of fat and everything else. She'll tell you, and you're a dietitian from a, at least from a dietary background, the amount of protein we eat doesn't vary very much. It's around 15 to 20% of our diet. What varies is the percentage of protein and at least of fat and carbohydrates. That's what we play with. The protein is very constant, irrespective of diet. It can go up or down a little bit intentionally, but it's very constant. It's the sugar and the fat that vary. So 
you really don't have to worry too much. If you're focusing on not eating carbohydrates, automatically you're going to increase your fat as long as you don't have a roadblock that fat's going to hurt you. It's an automatic conversion. So again, if you simplify this, we don't measure anything, we don't count anything, you want to know, yes, no. And it's that simple. However, my personal little statement is that vegetables are a bit like, and this is biased against what I just said, but vegetables are a bit like a glass of wine. They're a lot of fun, but they have no value. Okay, interesting. If you never drank a glass of wine again, your life would be poorer for it to a certain extent, but no harm is done. And the same thing with vegetables. But you don't start at carnivore, you can migrate that way. It's an anti-inflammatory diet. But I've got a lot of patients in India. You heard me talking to somebody overseas just before this podcast. I've got a group of diabetic patients in India. They're vegetarian. So we have to manage them. But there's green vegetarian and white vegetarian. And if you can get them to go from white food to green food, what I mean by that is the starch white foods, the rices, the pavadams, the naans, toward the leafy vegetables, they do so much better. Interesting. And then is there ever a time when you worry about too much fat? Is that ever an issue? Absolutely, it is. And I think I never thought it would be because biologically, it shouldn't be. Biologically, and it's, this remains true, is that biologically, when you're eating a meal, the fat is your primary satiety marker. It gives you that satiety. So we always load up with fat on our meals. Now, if you're eating a ribeye steak, don't add fat to it maybe a little bit of butter to cook it in. But if you're eating a filet, add some fat to it. So fat is your satiety weapon, especially if you're trying to drop some weight. It triggers satiety early. And if you listen to those signals from your belly to your brain, you're going to eat less. However, the problem with ketogenic people, and this is some misinformation on the internet, is I said before that a snack is always an emotional event. It is never a nutritional event. And there are people on the internet that tell you, oh, you've got to suck on sticks of butter, or you've got to do the fat bombs. You've got to, and it's the, oh, you add a bunch of bullet crap to your coffee. You're adding fat. Now, if you look like one of the Olsen twins, that may be okay. But outside of that, that excess fat outside of mealtimes is the problem area. So yes, you can overeat fat, but it's when it's done intentionally as a non-nutritional snack to achieve some level of ketosis. That's ludicrous. And But if you're eating fat as part of a meal, you're not going to overdo it. Your body won't let you. So it's an interesting perspective. The luxury of my practice is we've got N. We, we've got a huge patient volume. So when I talked earlier on about insulin suppression, what we saw is in our carnivore patients over time, they became so fat adapted but they were still eating a lot of protein. They were lean mass hyper responders, low, low body weight, high, high LDL, high cholesterol, high ketone levels or elevated ketone levels. But we found that they were so insulin suppressed that their insulin wasn't responding adequately, especially three or four hours after a meal to clear that excess blood sugar. So what we found is their blood sugar started going up. And this is a few, about four or five years ago now, maybe six years ago, we said, okay, we understand physiologically that elevated blood sugar triggers insulin because that was the conventional thinking. So we said, okay, how do we get the blood sugar to go up so we can get that insulin to bring it down? The obvious way to do it in the carnivores is to give them lean protein. So we alternated, we created a whole diet, a really good diet based upon Ted Naiman and Maria Emmerich and some of those folks. And Maria is a great friend of mine, but we based it on their principles of a high protein, very lean carnivore diet. And they were miserable. Their numbers got worse. They were hungry as all heck. They, their blood sugars, their blood number, their diabetic numbers went through the roof and they were just miserable. They were eating all the time. They were snacking. They couldn't get full. So we realized, and that is where when I talk to you about the fact that blood sugar does not trigger insulin, that's that experiment. We took a thousand patients and we studied them, a thousand patients, and we did the study and we had zero and zero in healthcare is rare. We had zero that loved the diet and it failed. It failed absolutely. So we proved that all those principles have failed. And once you, and they, a lot of them automatically reintroduced fat. So they reintroduced fat and they did really well by reintroducing fat. But when we went to the higher fat diet, and in fact, now on those carnivores, when they're insulin suppressed, we introduce 
a little bit of glucose, typically glucose and galactose, you know where that comes from, but we introduce mm -hmm. that not to raise sugar, but to trigger GLP-1, which raises insulin, which clears the sugar. That's the new diet, and that seems to be working really well as long as they're patient. It takes a month or two to happen, but that's how we treat insulin suppression. And Ben Bickman has seen the same thing in his cells. He calls it something different. I created that word, insulin suppression, because we see these low insulin numbers with elevated blood sugars and a flat, a type 5 or a pattern 5 craft table where they're just not producing insulin. If you've had a stroke and you're sitting in a chair and you're not moving, if you're me who moves moderately, or if you're Sean Baker who exercises 36 hours a week and is three times my size and it's all muscle, we are different people and we have to individualize therapy. And one of the things I pride myself in our practice is I get to know you first, meet you where you are and say, okay, what works for you? So along those lines, when we're talking about protein, where do you think day in and day out? the overwhelming majority of your nutrition comes from? And most people, even learned people, get this question wrong. I'd have to say from maybe my own body tissue stores. You're too smart. You're right. But what most people, especially the dietitians and most of the public don't understand, is the human body already has within it, in this era of abundance, whether you're eating a crappy diet or a good diet, we're eating so much that we have way more than enough. Our bodies are struggling with abundance. And we've got so much inside of us that, and the body is extremely efficient because it's designed to tolerate starvation. So the body is continuously undergoing autophagy, rebuilding cells, breaking them down, repairing them, creating new cells. There's this flux continuously, and there's this huge pool of micro and macronutrients. And the body is very efficient at reusing those. Most of my patients can eat nothing but water and electrolytes for a month, and they'll have no measurable nutrient deficiencies. So... It's the abundance and all of the, so all we're doing from meal to meal is topping up that tiny fraction that we actually lost. Now, if you're eating carbohydrates, they all get burnt off at energy. So you're having a bigger flux when you're eating carbohydrates. But when you're eating fat and protein, that has nutrient value as well as energy value, and it's recycled and repurposed. So when you're on a carnivore diet or a keto, not even carnivore, a ketogenic diet, you need a tiny fraction to top up. And the thinking of most people giving laboratory type advice is they don't take into account the recycling. So they tell us our meals should be everything that the body needs, ignoring what's already inside of us, as if we were empty. And that's where the 2,000 calories a day, I can't remember when last I did that. And I'm still got a little bit of a weight issue. So don't understand that we don't, that metric is not sold to us adequately. And it's that abundance, it's that excess, whether you're a lean mass hyper responder, whether you're Sean Baker. Now, Sean can eat 12 ribeyes a day. I do that, I can't, I'm in trouble. Paul Saladino can eat all the fruit and vegetables he wants to, and hopefully he'll sell enough product that at some stage he'll be able to buy a shirt because he's so, I'm, I, Paul's a good guy, but Paul doesn't, his work doesn't apply to most of my patients. And so you've got to really not be part of somebody else's algorithm. You've got to know where you are and they can motivate you. But they're rookies. They're people who are in preventer phase. They've fixed all the problems. It depends on where you are in, your, in, your, in the stages of change of your health, in your own personal algorithm that is unique to you. That's a perfect place to end. I think personalized medicine is the best way. So you've got to match the person. And to do that, you really got to get to know them. And it sounds like that's what you do. Hey, if people want to find out more about you or potentially work with you, Dr. Saivas, how do they do that? What's the best place to follow you? And if they want to actually maybe get a hold of you and become a patient, how do they do that? Sure. So across social media, I branded myself as Carb Addiction Doc. So it's at Carb Addiction Doc, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. On YouTube, I've got the same channel. It's, at, it's Carb Addiction Doc. We put out videos about twice a week, and it's all the topics that we've talked about. There's a deeper dive into each of those topics on YouTube, and it's nice if they can subscribe to that. And then the final piece is I am a clinically practicing doctor, so we have a phone number. It's a cell phone. You can text. You can message. You can WhatsApp. My international patients will WhatsApp 561-517-0642. And that's the way you can set up a consult. Challenge is that there is a long waiting list. You can get on the waiting list, but we are booking well ahead. So if you do want to see us, be patient. But we think the value is there. <laughs>
That's excellent. We'll put all that information in the show notes and I appreciate your time and all the expertise you brought to this podcast, Dr. Rob Saivas. Thanks again. I know that when I get on my soapbox, I'm a little evangelical and I apologize for that, but there's just so much to talk about. And I love the space so much, as do you. I can tell that you're very knowledgeable and you know the space and you love the space. And nothing resonates more with your patients than your passion for what you do. If you're tired and burnt out, you're not having a good visit. That's right. Choose something else. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here and enjoy spending the time with you. Thank you. Thank you. 